Hello, friends, and welcome to the Dimension of Our Midnight Cake, a weekly transmission from the Nexus of Realities. I'm Soltis, and joining me is my friend and fellow trans-dimensional being, Beaches. No, I didn't like Men in Black International. I do have some stats. (laughs) (laughs) Thor Love and Thunder is a 2022 American superhero film. It is the sequel to Thor Ragnarok from 2017 and the 29th film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The film was directed by Taika Waititi, who co-wrote the script with Jennifer Caitlin Robinson and stars Chris Hemsworth as Thor alongside Christian Bale as Gore, the God Butcher, Tessa Thompson, Jamie Alexander, Taika Waititi himself, Russell Crowe, and Natalie Portman. In the film, Thor attempts to find inner peace, but must return to action and recruit Valkyrie, Korg, and Jane Foster, who is now the mighty Thor, to stop Gore, the God Butcher, from eliminating all gods. Hemsworth and Waititi had discussed plans for a sequel to Ragnarok by January 2018. Waititi wanted to differentiate Love and Thunder from Ragnarok, seeking to make a romance film and 1980s-inspired adventure. He adapted elements from Jason Aaron's run on the Mighty Thor comic book, which sees Foster take on the mantle and powers of Thor while under treatment for cancer. Robinson joined to contribute to the script in February 2020, and further casting was revealed later that year, including the appearance of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Production was expected to begin in late 2020, but was delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Filming ultimately began in January 2021 in Sydney, Australia, and concluded at the beginning of June, and was released in the United States on July 8th as part of Phase 4 of the MCU. The film earned praise for its lighthearted nature and the cast performances, particularly those of Bale, Hemsworth, and Portman, while criticism was aimed at the screenplay and tonal inconsistency, with several critics deeming the film inferior to its predecessor. Love and Thunder, at the time of this transmission, has grossed over $601 million worldwide, becoming the seventh highest grossing film of 2022. Thor Love and Thunder is 119 minutes long and was made on a budget of $250 million. As with all of our discussions, there will be heavy spoilers. If this is a film that you are interested in seeing for yourself, then I recommend stopping the transmission and go watch it. We'll still be here when you get back. If you happen to enjoy our discussions and would like to contribute or get in contact with us, consider visiting our website at OurMidnightCake.com, liking, subscribing, and sharing the transmission with your friends. Join us next week as we will gather together in the Nexus to discuss Idiocracy, the 2006 American science fiction comedy film directed by Mike Judge and co-written by Judge and Eaton Cohen. We've had a lot of conversations about this off the record, and it's been pretty well documented that I did not care for this movie at all. And it's been fairly well documented that that you do care for this I, movie. I pretty well, I enjoyed it, yeah. Okay. I enjoyed it twice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Overall, general impressions of the movie, what were your initial reactions to it? My initial reaction, it was both kind of what I was hoping for. I don't want to say I was surprised because I feel like I got what I was expecting, but I did find some of it surprising. I enjoyed it as another another classic for adventure. <laughs> Okay. I am decidedly opposite that. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I did not think that it was a classic Thor adventure. No, not in the Norse mythology sense. But <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but in what had been established in the Marvel canon. Can I just say, I have, before 2011, I always thought it was just weird, you know, Marvel co opting this uh, mythological character into their superhero comics. I mean, to me. <laughs> To me, it was like if you made, uh, you know, Jesus part of the, the Super Friends or something. <laughs> I, think South, I think South Park did that, though, didn't they? Yes, they did. <laughs> to me, this movie seems to be like nobody gave a second thought as to what they were doing. Any ideas they had, the actions, the lines, the costumes, the setting, anything, it seems to not have been developed past the what if stage. The emotional tone has no cohesion. It whips back and forth constantly from one extreme to the other several times within the same scene as it goes along. And that was very exhausting to me to try and make sense of what the movie is trying to communicate to me, how I should be feeling in any given moment if 
everything is undercut with a joke and then undercut again with something serious, and then undercut that with a joke again. And then we get to the conveniences and what I can only call surprise mechanics. The writers didn't seem to have thought through and the audience is not supposed to think about. In my estimation, this is a terribly thought out and constructed movie. I feel like there are plenty of movies, even well thought of movies, that thrive on things that hopefully the audience doesn't think too hard about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> because at the end of the day, these are all just stories that sort of live in, you know, encapsulated in their own universes. <laughs> You know, and I'm talking about movies in general. I know the MCU exists in a wider universe. But. Well, and on that regard, it seems like Disney is trying to do two things at the same time, where mm -hmm. all the movies and TV shows are a part of the same universe, but not at the same time. I would agree with you there. I was a big proponent of, you know, Infinity Saga, and they should just end it. Yes, me you too. Know, I was all about, like, let's let's do, like, Let's do like solo Iron Man movies now that aren't connected to anything else. Let's see what that feels like again. So speaking to some of the scenes you mentioned, this is the movie I saw. Okay. I saw a movie about a man that had kind of decided to pick himself out of the grief and the loss that he had been existing in to the point that he had cast off his old persona of the, uh, the godlike superhero not fully, okay, because he's he's not a, a whole person yet. He knows what life has to offer him, which is the uh, whole thing about waiting around for someone to say, we need you for this battle. He's accepted that. He, you know, that's, that's what life has in store for him. He kind of uh, exists like that until he bumps into two of his old lost loves, one being Mjolnir and the other being... Uh... <laughs> that's... <laughs> That's something that I had a problem with is that Mjolnir and Stormbreaker <laughs> have been devolved into teenage girls fighting over the affections of a boy. I love, though, that the weapons and not just Mjolnir and Stormbreaker, uh, the Necrosword even, they're almost like characters. I mean, they pretty much are characters. There are characters in this film. I don't like that. I do not think that it was executed very well or that any thought was given beyond, oh, hey, wouldn't it be funny if? To me, one of the big questions going into this movie was, uh, how does Mjolnir come back and what has it got to do with Jane? Why is she suddenly able to become a Thor? Obviously. And we're given a bit of an explanation in the, uh, the montage of their relationship set i thought hysterically to an abba song <laughs> which is the last song you would have expected in thor movie. <laughs> and we get that scene of him uh asking mjolnir to to protect jane and you're left to think oh i get it now you know it's a bit of asgardian magic so mjolnir is protecting jane and that's what's going on i think that was a ruse i think that mjolnir is not projecting jane that from the beginning jane's dying and that she's always going to that's her fate and that mjolnir is almost just using her to protect thor i don't think that the writers thought that when they were doing this i don't know that they thought much of anything when they were doing this. i feel like it's pretty obvious i felt like that was something they were definitely trying to convey mjolnir coming back wasn't so much about jane as it was about thor well Mjolnir does spend a good deal of the movie fighting Stormbreaker for Thor's attention. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't see that, but I will say you, there was definitely the, the jealousy coming off of Stormbreaker. Like Mjolnir is Thor's ex. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I don't know. I just, I enjoyed the silliness. <laughs> I did not. I, and I'm, I, I'm not down on fun and I'm not down on silliness or people <laughs> having a good time. I think that a lot of the jokes were mean spirited, especially really? with regards to Thor. Yes. I, he, he's, I, he's the butt of, of the jokes in this movie. <laughs> and I didn't feel where, like he was before, presented as any dumber than he had been before. I do. And I will, I will take, if you look back from, from when we were first introduced to Thor Okay, and he is kind of a fish out of water. He doesn't understand a lot of the social norms and customs or idioms because he's from a different place. And okay. then it seems like over the course of the movies that one that of my has favorite lines, the uh, extrapolated the, horse, the, 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 um, 
the pet, pet shop scene. Oh yes. Yes. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is a joke that's not, a, mm-hmm. not against him as much as it's mm-hmm. just, yeah, he, he just doesn't understand the world. Yeah. And it's been extrapolated to where he's now an absolute moron. How, how with, with little regard for what's going on around him. I, I mean, if, if, do you have a, do you have an example? Or... When we're first introduced to Thor. Okay. And he's, which I, I think was, was, a, was a missed opportunity where it shows that he's apathetic towards adventure and battle. And he's kind of lost his willingness and zeal for life in that regard. Mm-hmm. And if they were to combine that with with a motivation for gore for going out and killing all the gods because of their apathy and lack of motivation to help people. I think that that would have been an excellent plot point, but they didn't do anything with that. But with Thor, the the first big battle, the guardians of the galaxy and Thor are called to end the war of these, of these peoples over this temple because gore has killed the gods that have been protecting these these people and had established a peace in the land. And now this, this civilization has devolved into warring factions and they're trying to figure out who's going to take over. This shows how callous that this Thor is. He doesn't care about people's lives. He's just there existing without contributing anything. And then when he finally does contribute something, it's played off as a joke where he doesn't care for any sort of collateral damage. He ends up destroying the temple that they've been trying to protect. But it's destroyed now. And I don't, was there anybody inside when it was collapsing? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't like to think of Thor as as killing innocent people because he didn't care enough to do anything correctly. It's, it's just haphazard, and it really rubbed me the wrong way with how all this was presented. But it's funny because he's standing there and the building's collapsing while he's victorious when he failed in his objective. Okay. If we're going to take this opening battle way too seriously. <laughs> no, no, no. Because so this I, is, feel, I feel like this we is, are. This is how we establish the characters. More so than what is said is, is what we see and what we see the characters do. I'm saying because of all the loss and failure he's experienced, Thor is being presented apathetic. And yes, even the destruction of the tower was all in service of laughs. Like it, it, didn't, it, didn't, think, it didn't hit for me. I didn't think it was as funny as Ragnarok. No. And with that, I think that, that one of the reasons why that was may have been because there were times in Ragnarok that was very solemn and serious. And, oh, and Taika knew when to, when to let things settle. I and feel the then exact when opposite. to make things funny. I feel like this movie did a much better job of letting the uh, somber moments sit than Ragnarok did. There were so many times in Ragnarok. That was a bold maybe claim, not, sir. <laughs> maybe not so many times. There were one or two times in Ragnarok, uh, particularly the destruction of Asgard. And I was saying Korg makes a joke. Obviously, Korg's not making a joke. Korg's saying a Korg thing that is a joke in the context of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, that's a moment that we definitely should have allowed to be emotional for the people who've been following this since the first Thor movie, uh, rather than play a joke. I hated that moment. Despise that moment as well. But in this film, we open on Gore. Mm -hmm. He's the representation of just mortals in general. And he's wandering through this desert on an unnamed world. He's praying to his God for help and we see his daughter die in his arms and i think he's uh then there waiting by her grave to die himself we don't get a single haha until the next scene yeah, but now with gore i do want to say that christian bale performs magnificently uh, yeah i enjoyed his performance i yeah. believe that he and and chris hemsworth are better than this movie deserves I don't know how Tessa Thompson keeps getting work. She is I don't mind Tessa. I, I think uninteresting. I think she and probably wasn't people. that useful to the narrative. No, no, no. She, she's not. She's there because I think because Taika Waititi wants her to be there, but she's not but this, a main uh, okay, contributor. Like her is another instance of people just, just over-examining this movie, like the people who have been offended by the Infinity Cone scene. 
it's oh, it's just that's something else that it's I just think a, is it's a quick visual movie. gag it's <laughs> that to me is one of the problems indicative of this whole movie is that it's just a gag it's just a joke it's like uh -huh. look how not seriously we're taking the slaughter of trillions of people uh, it, it's not even tony stark's infinity gauntlet it's thanos's gauntlet and mm -hmm. and this is something that i'm assuming quote unquote king valkyrie had to approve there's no world building with these gags it's it does more harm than good isn't there no if, isn't if you start there? to think about it she no. has built <laughs> she has built new asgard into a destination tourist attraction a thriving community and this stuff is part of it that it's connection to the avengers and space uh, you know as a whole <laughs> oh sure and and next time i can't wait to go ride the the gas chamber ride at the holocaust park <laughs> like it's it's so it is so tone deaf with with what these people have experienced being slaughtered on you know thanos comes for their ship destroys them only you know half of them are able to escape um kills loki just you know just beats up thor and then with the snap and they lose half of their population again presumably okay obviously here, we would let's sell snow cones <laughs> of the the, <laughs> the the gas chamber ride in real life but within the context of an arguably humorous movie <laughs> Arguably, <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't, I, it doesn't I, play for me. <laughs> I, I I enjoyed it, um, but with Gore, we have the opportunity to have a an incredibly interesting villain that is thrown away. I, I mentioned a little bit about his motivations. Where you don't think Thor because, or not Thor? Everybody is this Thor, Gore, Korg. They all sound the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't you don't think Gore is interesting? I don't. He's a cartoon villain in the fact that that his motivation well, so is, is to Hela. kill all gods so that he can kill all gods. At least he has a motivation. Hela was just, I'm evil Hela. Yeah, well, I'm not saying that Hela was any better. Okay, okay. All, all, all I've said was that Gore is very unidimensional in this regard. First of all, I have to argue that kill all gods is not Gore's motivation. What is his motivation? Uh, Gore, the mortal, would never have killed a god, uh, particularly not his own god. From the moment he creeps into that, uh, that oh, I don't know what you call it, that little uh, godly oasis, he mm -hmm. is, um, he's cut by the Necrosword, he's infected, the god even says you've been cursed, and he's given that vision from the Necrosword. That all comes from the Necrosword. And that's the weakness in the villain plot, I would say, is that we're not given more of a backstory on the Necrosword. Well, that's certainly true. That the motivation still seems to be to kill all gods. Yes, yes. And I'm simply arguing that that's not from the moment. Oh, that, that that's Gore, not Gore's personal yeah, that's, motivation. It's but not that's even the really Gore. Yeah, yeah. That's the Necrosword's motivation. Oh, okay. Well, then the Necrosword is a unidimensional villain <laughs> yeah. okay okay <laughs> that, that could use some fleshing out i admit it's a flimsy distinction <laughs> yeah i i don't know about his his plan for kidnapping the, the the children and then relying on their benevolence and need to act to save these children as the way to trap them I feel like the real problem is we don't understand the original Necrosword, the motivation. We, we don't understand why it wants to end all gods. That's very true. We don't, there, there we don't know where many that things comes in this from. Movie that are I, I would argue that explained. like with the Asgardian children, um, you know, so we'll just say Gore as the host of the Necrosword. Gore ends up on Asgard. He's fighting Thor and Valkyrie and other Thor. And, um, oh, you know, that's... he's not exactly he's not exactly winning that fight. So he retreats and he has noticed or the Necrosword has noticed that Thor is fighting for these people, you know, benevolence or not. I, I feel like the benevolence issue was more Gore's thing. And that yeah, the Necrosword and that, and that clouds that line between who is yeah. the villain? Is it is it Gore or is it the Necrosword? So, so to me, the Necrosword 
doesn't care. It's going to, it's going to see the end of the gods, no matter what, even if Thor and Thor spends the whole movie proving that, you know, I do care about stuff. <laughs> Here I am. I'm fighting for all this stuff. So when he sees that he uses the Asgardian children to lure Thor, because in that vision, we're shown that um, they're after the Bifrost. That's another problem, is the Bifrost. It's always a problem when you introduce a new mechanic that has infinite possibilities and uses, which is something that could have been very interesting in having a conversation about when Thor and Gore get to eternity. Okay, say what you want about the VFX in the movie. Okay. Um, They're not great. I, I, in the second time around, I saw this in 3D and seeing, like in the regular movie, Infinity just looked like this shape, you know. But in the 3D, you actually like saw the depth into the, the universe and it looked like you were looking into a something, which was pretty cool. Okay, well... So one point, for 3D. <laughs> one point for 3D. One point for 3D. When Thor and Gore are talking, they have this conversation about, because now they have this ability to change anything and everything with this wish. And they can have a, a conversation about what to use the wish for. Is it for the, the betterment of everybody? The betterment of just one person? The betterment of nobody you can use that as a moment to explore the characters and where they are when they're faced with something that could forever alter the course of everything and this is a complaint that i've raised before about the stakes in various movies where the stakes just keep getting higher and higher and higher and higher instead of doing something more localized yeah. with this wish yeah. it introduces another one of those mechanics where anything can happen because of of what they do and then then using this it eliminates it for everybody else right the way i understood it it was the first person to reach eternity mm -hmm. gets the wish gets the wish and then and i then thought i thought your argument wish. was going to be how is gore the first person to reach eternity well, that, that, that's another <laughs> argument like how how has in the entirety of eternity up until this point no one been able to reach Eternity. It seemed to me like it was at least suggested in this that only ultra powerful god tier beings would even know about this. And mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't care about magical wishes. I would think that they would, though, especially if you if you consider the ramifications of of anything <laughs> you can you can make anything happen with this wish like that would be something that. I would think if they knew about it, they would want to cordon off and protect or use themselves so that you know nobody else could could screw with it. If okay. nothing, if, if if we are to well, believe that, least, that all the gods least, are um, terrible people, Zeus then... seem pretty confident that it couldn't be reached. But what he didn't think about was that uh, the Asgardians, the protectors of the Bifrost, were gone now. Um, and you still had at least one method to use it, which was Stormbreaker. That gets into another finicky thing with how the Bifrost is is accessed and, and what, what the Bifrost is generally. And is it is it only for the Asgardians? Are they the only people in all of everything to be able I mean, to... The Bifrost is definitely a, a thing of Norse mythology. So it, it would is. seem that for whatever reason, like I said, the Asgardians seem to be the wielders and the protectors of this particular magic mm -hmm. or power okay. whatever you want to call it the, did odin know about eternity i i would assume yes would odin have had the wisdom to do anything about that or just yeah. let it stay where it is if the bifrost is the is the key to getting to eternity you know eternity is a being right yes okay would there be any any safeguards put in place nobody can get to eternity because it's too much of a powerful i have entity. no I, the only safeguard that yeah, ever that's... seemed to be in place was heimdall yeah and you know we, we saw that he was not always the ultimate solution against things he was a tough guy but and then when thor 
realizes what's going on why doesn't he take the bifrost to eternity i imagine if the, if and we are led to believe that the the necrosword has been wandering around before gore you know there's that creature that uh, that was slain that they were celebrating over mm-hmm. you would think it would have if it had been possible it would have tried you know the asgardian bifrost at some point that that's is, a little that's, haphazard that's weak <laughs> <laughs> also what is a god that is an excellent question i feel haven't i brought that up before like like marvel i'm has sure you have a, marvel has sort of an issue with gods i mean from the the introduction of the asgardians to the um you know ego when ego was asked if he was a god he's like small g <laughs> he <laughs> wanted to make that he's like i'm not like one of those religious figures you talk about but <laughs> i do have i do have godlike power and with thor and the asgardians it's been explained uh, especially by odin himself that they are not gods that they're born they live they die yes the way that it is introduced at least within the umbrella of the mcu is that the asgardians are very powerful beings that were worshipped as gods by the ancient norse mm-hmm. but they themselves are not divine then you, you get into the, the you, various you have other the eternals pantheons. the eternals became the basis for human legends of gods and things Mm -hmm. so you've got you do you have all these characters floating around the mcu that's you know like the internals the eternals don't claim to be gods Mm -hmm. um but then again neither do the i mean within the, the the asgardians don't seem to be my don't seem to mind being seen as gods even if within their own ranks uh, Mm -hmm. they know that so they are essentially mortal Mm -hmm. which i I don't know how you i i guess these maybe that's another problem is that for some reason the introduction of other pantheons of gods Uh where you have now now you have the greek gods and then with mood night you had the egyptian gods and all of these entities are supposed to be existing together and for some reason they all are in self-imposed quarantine on this on omnipotent city which nobody had heard about or you know they apparently the asgardians know about it (laughs) but it was not a thing that had any consideration up until now i I just and these gods bleed golden blood yes that's that's the point i was like so are the asgardians gods because they don't bleed golden but they're a different i just think i think within the mcu you have to assume that anything like like i said at the beginning um gore at least at the beginning of the film is our representation of a mortal Mm -hmm. you know he's he's relatively powerless he lives a brief brief lifespan and then he dies whereas the the more powerful long life beings among the universe are what we're considering gods here even if they're not necessarily the sort of creator of existence, religious figures that, that we, we would attribute the word to. You do have kind of a nice mirroring of the two characters, though. Do you? I think so. And maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but you have Gore, who do impart to the love of his daughter, is eventually sort of given power through the necrosword and then you have a uh, thor who is somewhat made who already has power is somewhat made vulnerable to due to his love for uh jane yeah i can see that okay jane and and to a lesser degree the asgardian children oh that oh, <laughs> stupid kids <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that but we're not all as guardians <laughs> well you are today <laughs> yeah and you get to be thor and you get to be thor and you get to be thor never mind never mind what, what would happen if you suddenly gave a child <laughs> the powers of a god no 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 it's fine <laughs> there is no forethought that has gone into this film and me i was just i was just in rapture (laughs) it was it was it was so fantastic that flipping bunny i disagree (laughs) (laughs) 
but it seems like like Taika Waititi f- has fallen victim to believing his hype. The people love me. I can I can do whatever I want, and it'll be awesome. And so he did whatever he wanted, and it's terrible for me. Or or you agree with his hype, and it was great. <laughs> that is the opposite end of that coin. <laughs> Be- before this movie, I was confident in Taika Waititi's ability to balance tone. But a- after this, I have doubts. And I, I don't want to see him do a Star Wars movie. I don't want to see him do anything else. I want to see him do his own stuff. I mean, I'd rather not see him waste his time on a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm... I'm, I'm... You you all know my feelings on the current Disney Star Wars at this point. Final thoughts on this movie? Love or hate this movie, you're part of a large group of people. This this film has defined mixed reviews. (laughs) There are just as many negative as there are positive and vice versa. (laughs) I did not care for this movie. I think that it is poorly conceived and executed. And it's magical I, I and as guardian flim flam magic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is weak writing. <laughs> magic. I love magic. I love magic. I do too, but it has to be based in reality. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's a movie. It does. It does. It's they're, a movie. They're... Yes. I go to the movie and specifically the movie... not to see reality. <laughs> I don't want any reality in my movie. <laughs> Well, then this was the perfect <laughs> movie for you because there was no reality in this movie. <laughs> I want, I want Thor flying on Stormbreaker like the Wicked Witch like of the West. Like a broom? Like the Wicked yes. Witch? Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in the dimension of our Midnight Cape. We hope you'll visit us again. From myself, Lumberdor, Beaches, and Doug, thank you, and good night. Oh, hey, Doug. Hey. Hello. <laughs> so shall we start over? <laughs> I I forgot what my pithy one-liner was going to be. So I had a good one. It's gone. I had well, a, you know, for anyway. my intro about... Hey, welcome to the next one. <laughs> I'm doing the splits right now. How's that? <laughs> nice. Or well, got a new superpower, the splits. You're doing that uh, JCVD. <laughs> I can't stand, I could not stand that. That instantly, I loved it. It that so instantly angered me. <laughs> so we haven't we haven't been going in in a scene by scene order. Okay. Because no, we would no. we would be here for you know 14 hours. Yeah, <laughs> forever. Dissecting it. Of what me saying I like did. this for this reason, and Sultas saying I didn't like it for that reason. For the same <laughs> that reason. Same reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt watching this. Because I had heard from Sultis, I hate this movie with the fire of a thousand suns. I I heard I heard from the beaches and Lumberdor <laughs> saying, you know what? It was I had fun with it. I thought it was fun. Um, I don't know if you said it was good. Did you say it was good or just fun? That is an important distinction. Personally, you enjoyed it. it. I, I'm oh I'm gonna go down as saying it's not like it, it, it's not gonna be like one of my favorite movies ever. What is what is the Thor movie ranking? If we oh, took all four of them, okay, which... I, I can't do this. <laughs> okay, I Ragnarok's number one. Obviously. I feel terrible agreeing with that because I was a fan of Thor from the first movie. I was the one arguing that Thor was the best of the solo Thor films is good. In phase the first one, one is I, good. I I love it, and I don't hate uh, Dark World. It's. See, for me, it's it's Ragnarok, I, I the think, first one, Dark World, and then this one at the bottom. I'm going to have to put this one above Dark World. Ah, okay. Okay. See, that gives us a gauge there. Because all I'm really... Dark World is a whole lot of the first movie revisited, but I love... I think it's one of the more visually interesting Marvel films uh, of yeah, that yeah. period. That's fair. Uh, with the exception of the Guardians movies, obviously. Yeah, that's fair.
And over here, Soltis is like, this is below, this is below <laughs> multiverse of madness. He's like, this, this is below is multiverse old. of madness. For, for me, it's contending. This is below Loki. The worst. Like the worst. <laughs> because I, I, I think that, I think that, that how this might pull above multiverse of madness is that, is that, no. No, I, I don't know. I, I think, like, I think gonna, <laughs> here's my You're question. Like, they're, just, they're just both equally the worst. <laughs> here's my question. They're so bad. Is, so bad is, this, is this better or worse than Kenobi? Oh. oh uh, don't, don't do that to his brain. I'm just giving all the existential questions. Hey, hey, you know what? You know what? I asked Soltis if he would ever watch uh, Kenobi again. And he said, I'd rather be digested by a Jack of Beans. <laughs> 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 oh, that, that little midget. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, Does anyone so just... believe she could run away that fast from anyone? She's just like. Bip, 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 bip. <laughs> Except when she can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're doing overall four vibes. Yeah. Basically. Am, I, am I a bad Star Wars fan because I liked Kenobi? No, no, I was a bad Star Wars fan when I spent my childhood bored to tears by the original trilogy. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, <laughs> I was never that into it. Like, Empire Strikes Back thing. is my favorite. Man. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. I was not bored to tears, however. I was just not like a super fan. I was like, this is cool. 